Hi guys, so today we are joined with the lovely Winifred, who is in the financial and entrepreneurship background. Um, so I'll pass it over to you to give your, your little bit of a background on yourself. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much, Anissa. And thank you to Slink for having me on this podcast as well. Um, as Anissa has said, my name is Winifred Saribe, and I am currently finalizing my PhD in the area of entrepreneurial finance at the University of Bedfordshire in Luton. Uh, prior to that, I spent the last 10 years or last decade rather of my life in academia. I started off with a BSc in economics. Then I, that was when I was back in Nigeria. Then I went on, came on to the UK to qualify as a chartered accountant with the ACCA. Uh, that is the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. Then I moved progress to do a master's in accounting and business finance. And then before I got the scholarship to do the PhD, which I am currently finalizing. So I spent a bit of time in that. That is what I'll call my home. But on a more personal level, I started, I consider myself an entrepreneur, really, or very entrepreneurial person. I started my own first business at the age of nine, and it was all about making storybooks. So it was uh, three friends of mine and myself. We formed the company in quotes, and then we used to dance like the final year of primary school. So we'd make the storybooks and then we'd put sweets on the cover, sell it on to schoolmates. And the more expensive the sweet, the higher the price of the book. So that, that was how we gauged how much to sell it. And then afterwards, I moved on to high school and I ran several high side hustles. So I went to an all girls school. So we, what I'll do is, why, and it was a boarding school. So once you got in, like it was a Catholic boarding school, so very strict. Once you got in, you stayed there for the entire term before you came out um, at the end of term. So uh, once the term started, uh, from home, I'll buy jewelries, and once I bought those jewelries, I'll take them to school. Then I'll sell it on, you know, put on a margin and sell it on to my fellow schoolgirls. And so I did that, you know, while I was in high school, and then I until I got into university, um, where I studied economics, like I said. And by then, I really understood the going uh, back and forth of trade. But I think why I really, really picked up on that was because my mom had a fashion store. So she would travel to different countries, buy stock, bring it back to Nigeria to sell. So, you know, my, my idea of coming back home from primary school those days, or you come back home to this large stock of goods and you had to start taking inventory of them, so I think very on, it just instilled in me the whole idea of accounting, maybe, I don't know, but um, just taking, keeping stock of stuff. I still find myself very much being able to keep stock of things today. So I, I think that played a role. I think it did strongly. My dad as well um, also was in public service, but he also had a farm business. So every weekend he'd take all of us to the farm it's not like we really were doing anything, but I think it was just trying to instill in us that um, you can do several things at the same time. So I think all those have contributed to who I am today. So yeah, that's really a summary of me on a professional and a personal level. So you, you basically come from a family of entrepreneurs, which is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can say that. That's amazing. Um, so obviously, as we've already um, discussed, the purpose of this session and the whole series is to discuss um, your personal opinions on minority women in the workforce and the struggles of minority women, in your opinion, um, and also to, to talk about your personal journey as well. Um, so I know you're coming from more of a research type of background so what were your opinions on the struggles of minority women in the workforce or the lack thereof in the workforce okay um in terms of the lack so I remember when I started my PhD uh I remember that was I, I still remember the day that was 15th of October 2018 so 
Uh, I remember the first day of induction because we had a week long induction of just knowing what you're doing, um, you know, knowing where to go and for support and things like that. But I, I remember going into the class so where I'd meet my other colleagues and I noticed that um, there were quite a few women, um, majority of them were women. So that, that was very impressive and that was sort of very relieving um, that you could see other women there on track as well. Now, it's a case of uh, with, with things like PhD research starting on and finishing on, there's a really a huge difference because it's such a long time, three to four years, um, not everyone that starts finishes. Um, so you, you really tend to get people that might drop up for personal reasons or professional reasons along the line. Now, in terms of the struggles of minority women, what you tend to say is within academia, it's more um, of men, um, especially in higher ed education, it's more of men than women. It might be because of the nature of the industry, because now you're doing, dealing with high stakes, um, you know, there are more things on the ground and it's not like high school or primary school or things like that. So there's, um, when you look at the university setting or, or the higher education setting, there's really more at stake, like I've said. So uh, that already means uh, the competition is fiercer. So for women that might not be very competitive, you might struggle um, in academia. I look at myself, especially mine is a bit more tailored because mine is finance and accounting, where you, you don't really tend to see a lot of women there. Um, so like, like I remember in my accounting department, at once um, in terms of the PhD students, I was the only female within the accounting and finance department. So it's not really, there are women, but it's not, it's not like when you go to management or to school, it's not like I'm trying to be biased, you know, towards those uh, departments, but it's a whole different ball game when you come to that. So I think, uh, first of all, for a woman, you have to be tougher. You have to uh, sort of really be confident in what you're doing and knowing that you know what you're doing. I think that's very, very much required. And, and that's what I've seen. Um, as a minority woman, I think, uh, Maybe it's the university I've gone to, but my university, University of Bethesda, tends to attract a lot of diverse students. Um, recently, uh, I think that was early this year or late last year, they were ranked for diversity. So in terms of diversity, they're quite diverse. So I don't really feel like, um, you know, I'm out of place because I tend to see a lot of people like me that would have different accents like me as well. So in terms of that, I don't really feel um, much uh, pressure in terms of that perspective. Then again, because most of my colleagues within the PhD um, you know, area would be international students as well. So that diversity tends to be there. It's just a case of the degree of competition and degree of work that is required. Just means that you really need to pull your socks up and do the work, yeah. I agree. Um, I can understand from your perspective where you've been around a lot of diverse people, you must have felt a lot more comfortable, which is really nice to hear as well because there aren't um, I would say the majority of places, um, whether it be universities or workplaces, you would find, you know, more than 80% diverse. Um, so that's really nice to hear that you haven't experienced that. Um, but as you mentioned, um, having to be tougher and a lot more competitive as a woman, what would you advise then for younger minority women who are looking to join the same industry? Would you advise them that they had to be tougher or do you think it's appropriate to then challenge that as a woman and say, well, actually we don't have to be tougher or fiercer, um, whereas equal as men are? Okay. Hmm. I think that's a tricky one. Um... Uh, because then when you, you know, if you approach it from the perspective of do we, you know, we're equal to men? Yes, we are. But um, I think you look at it more from a perspective of the, the nature 
and the makeup of men and women, it's two, two different things. I, I was recently watching on a podcast over the weekend uh, on YouTube and uh, I, the host, uh, when I, I've noticed, so I, this is a podcast I watch often and I noticed that when he's interviewing men, it's quite, you know, it's, it's a whole different kind of energy mm-hmm. to when he's interviewing women. So um, I think that just goes back to the nature of men and women. They're two different things. So um, you have to think about the fact that I don't think the nature of men is going to change per se. Um, And I don't think the nature of women needs to change. I, I think naturally women are a bit more, they're not as aggressive. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I see that in myself. I see in myself. I see the difference to myself and my partner and other male colleagues that I work with. I, I see the difference very clearly. But I think that um, because the nature of men is not necessarily going to change. And yes, we might say, yeah, there needs to be more equality. But I think from a more realistic perspective, I don't know how it's going to change. So saying that you know we're women and we don't need to adapt to the way or the workplaces or the nature of the workplaces we find ourselves um might not necessarily be the best advice in my perspective i I speak for myself Mm -hmm. so I, i think sometimes you might find go to certain organizations where you don't necessarily have to be competitive fine but um like i've said if you're going to come into the finance industry that is male dominated uh you have to sort of show those kinds of traits of wanting it as much as the other person wants it um and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily say that between women and women there's no competition there is equally competition between women and women as there is between men and women so um, I just think wherever you go in terms of, um, you know, trying to progress in your career, uh, you might need to, so first of all, observe what is the norm there, uh, you know, what are the traits of the leaders that you see around you and, uh, you know, how have they gotten there? And then from there, you develop your own strategy. If it's competitive, then you have to be competitive. If it's, not fiercely competitive and there are other techniques of getting there, then you try that. But I think it's very dynamic. I don't think there's a one rule for each one, for each um, sort of industry or wherever you decide to go on to work. Yeah, I think that's a fair opinion to have. And I, I like how you're mentioning more on personality traits and skill sets as opposed to gender. So I think the, I think not as much as an issue, um, but I think in terms of addressing the situation, it would be more a case of people being competitive based on skill sets and based yeah. on um, their motivations, their drive, their passions. And that's what should define somebody's success in their career, but not as much their gender. Um, but I do understand where you're coming from. And I think there are a lot of Um, specific industries that are a lot more obviously male dominated and so being a young woman especially a young minority woman might be very daunting to go into because you're then thinking you know how competitive do I have to be and you know am I ever going to live up to what these men are but I think it's important that we as women who have kind of come such a way in our careers are able to then inspire those young women and say well actually it doesn't matter if you're a young woman it doesn't matter if you're a minority woman what matters is your skill sets your talents and what drives you um yeah so yeah I think those are kind of really good indicators for success and I agree with what you're saying um in terms of your personal struggles and successes are there any like key examples that you'd like to mention um in terms of uh you know maybe being a minority woman or you know being a person of color or being a woman um I I think sometimes then again it comes to the industry uh, and you know where you want to go 
sometimes it, it might mean that you you have to work harder uh, maybe harder than maybe a white person would have to work I don't know I don't know how hard they have to work um, I, I know a lot of people say if you're a person of color you have to do it two times walk two times harder than your you know you're not your white counterpart I, I know that's something that is quite popular but I, I, I look at it from the perspective that you know even if you have to work harder it's only been I, I mean the harder you work you're only helping yourself become better at what you're doing so I think in terms of so I remember when I started my accounting qualification and then I, I you know I was a young student um, you know with the financial normal financial struggles but um, I think what really helped me then was um, then I was studying in Birmingham and the the way it was structured is when you come so it was ATCA you'd write uh, six papers every year. So then I studied with BPP. Then I would, so every time I come in for a diet, so that was for three months, I'll study for three exams. And so because of the sort of state I found myself in, I knew I had to be very disciplined with my time, disciplined with my money, disciplined with everything, because the way it worked, I preferred that when I was on an exam diet, I would not work, just focus on the exams. Uh, and then once you're done with the exams, you have three months off to go and, you know, just rest or work and then come back for the next three months. So. Uh, I think what really helped me then was discipline, a lot of discipline, a lot of time management. And so even though those were sort of really difficult times, it helped me really learn how to focus, learn how to study. And so in the end, I was able to complete the exams in under two and a half years, which is not uh, common, not common at all. I passed all the exams first time. So yeah. normally when people say, you know, as a minority, you have to work two times more. I'm like, you know, in a way you're helping yourself because you really become really, really good at what you're doing. And I, I, I believe that that discipline very early on helped me succeed academically. So when I went on to do a master's, at the University of Bedfordshire, it was more like a walk in the park because I'd done so much work at the qualification level. So I, I did the master's, I got a distinction in that one, and then I was able to get a scholarship. So all that really helped. So in a case, you're helping yourself if you really, really, um, in a sense, work hard and just make yourself um, a rare, not, not, I wouldn't say rare, but make yourself more of an asset to where, you know, wherever you go to, because the more work you put into yourself, the better you become. So I think that's, that's how I see it. So I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. And again, that's really inspiring. Um, it's something that I, a lot of young women will look up to and use as motivation for their own successes. And I agree. I think something that people may or may not know about minorities is, we have a lot of ancestors who, you know, once made a very brave decision to leave their home countries and come to a completely different country. And so that's where it was instilled in us that we had to work two times harder because we feel that we have to work two times harder just to feel normal um, or the same way that the people of the country we live in feel. And so I think that's something that is really special because I discussed this um, with Kunjo very early on in the series as well. And she also had the same opinions in that it's not just about driving ourselves. It's also about, you know, making our parents proud and making our ancestors yeah. proud and yeah. their sacrifices being worth it, um, which I think is really special and something that not everybody may realize. Um, so for young minority women who have been told their whole lives, you know, you're a, you're a woman, you know, you're not just a minority, but you're a, you're a girl as well. So like you have to work harder and you have to get your education and, you know, it's kind of just, it's also proving to yourself, but proving to those ancestors who made those sacrifices that it was all worth it. Um, and yeah. so it goes back generations. It's not just um, the present day, which is something that is, I think, going to continue 
um, throughout more generations as well. But yeah, I think it's something really special. And I think young minority women should feel more inspired that even though they are working harder, it's just giving them more passion, more drive. And I think any employer would see that as well, um, because the harder you want something, the better you will do at it. Um, and so what you just explained about you're passing your exams in two years, which is amazing, because that that normally takes, I mean, I, I would think about a minimum of five years to complete. Um, it's you know a really amazing achie uh, achievement and you should be very proud of yourself as I'm sure you are. Thank you. <laughs> um, so if there was like one piece of advice you would give to younger girls, um, what would you say to them? Uh, so I, I'll say, you know, we live in a time where, especially with social media, so I'm not a very heavy social media person, so I stick to LinkedIn because that, that is what works for me. But I, I, I really hear a lot of stories about people on Instagram, on Facebook, and there is a lot of peer pressure out there, you know, a pressure to conform to society, to, you know, to be a certain way, to, you know, want to look a certain way. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is with young ladies, you know, first of all, women to an extent are quite more impressionable than men, uh, especially at a younger age. You know, I want to be like Kim Kardashian. I want to be like this. And in a case that their reality and our reality is absolutely different. So be because of that, it just really creates a world where you're trying to be someone that you can never be, never. And maybe even if you were to become that person, there's no guarantee that you'd be happy that way. So I think for me, the advice I'll say is be yourself. You know, what works for you works for you. What doesn't work for you doesn't work for you. So if you find what works for you, you stick to it. You must not be, uh, you know, you mustn't just follow the bandwagon. Just try to be different in a way. Not totally, absolutely different, but, you know, be different in a way. You don't, you don't need to conform to every single thing you see online or around you. I think these days we're seeing the need for more individuality just because, you know, social media is like this way that is pulling everyone in a certain direction. And you just need to be able to stand apart. Um, I, I think that really does just make, makes a lot of difference. It makes you happier. It makes you, and I think then again, it, it would require some level of confidence to be able to stand out. But I think it's baby steps, isn't it? It's baby, it's not overnight, you know, just keep trying to do your own things the way that works for you, uh, you know, step by step, step by step. It might be, I don't know, your career. You're not trying to follow the same way everybody's going. Um, it might be that you decide, decide to do something totally different that you think would work better for you. Whatever it is, it's fine. It's just some form of individuality. I think that's that's where it all starts. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's, that's literally the golden thread of Slink. That's why we encourage people to create 35 second video CVs. Um, a question we get all the time is, oh, doesn't that encourage bias? Um, but I don't actually think so. I don't think it would encourage bias or discrimination because I think if someone has bias or discrimination in their mindset, um, it will continue whether or not they see a person's face. I mean, a lot of people have ethnical names um, and so you can discriminate based on reading somebody's name. So it is all about just being yourself and being unapologetically yourself as well. Um, yeah and not being afraid to show who you are because we are all different and we all have unique talents that should be showcased. Um, and none of the, the most successful people in the world were the same as everyone else, you know, that, that's why they were successful because they were different and they, they weren't sorry for being different either. So I think that's a really great piece of advice. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been great speaking with you. Um, lovely yeah. session. Yeah. And um, your story has inspired many people and I'm sure it will go on to inspire many people. So right. thank you so much for taking part. Thank you too, Anissa, for having me on. No problem. And I'll see you guys in the next series. So take care. Bye.